for a few minutes only. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Excellency, uh, lady and gentlemen. Um, my name is Uchan Darani. I'm a national economist of the UNDP. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the launch of uh, Cambodia Development uh, Finance Assessment, BFA reports. First, uh, I would like to inform you that uh, the event will be conducted in English and we have uh, enabled the interpreter function Please click on the globe icons and choose Khmer if you would like to listen to Khmer translation. If you have questions or comments, kindly drop it in the chat box or Q&A. Uh, please also note that the session is also uh, recorded. Uh, okay. uh, we will also share you the QR code. Um, and the link to download the report at the end of the Q&A section. And uh, we also, also like share with you the, the PowerPoint presentation uh, in, in the chat box uh, for you to download also. Okay, uh, please let me briefly go through the agenda of the events. We will uh, begin uh, with the welcome remark by Ms. Christine Paco, United Nations Resident Coordinator uh, at Interim. We are uh, also honored to have uh, Excellency Rosilova, Secretary of State of Ministry of Economy and Finance to provide an opening remarks. Then uh, Dr. Pam Ramsinaret, a UNDP National Macroeconomic Consultant, uh, will share some findings of the report with you. Uh, followed by a panel discussion and Q&A session, which is moderated by Mr. Nick Barasford, UNDP uh, resident representative. Okay, today we are delighted to have three distinguished guests to join the panel discussion. Uh, first, Excellency Chiesere, Assistant Governor and Director General of uh, Central Banking, National Bank of Cambodia. Uh, second, we have Dr. Chiem Vanarat, President of ASEAN Reason Institute. Third, uh, we have Dr. Radhika La, SDG Finance Policy Advisor of UNDP Regional Hub in Bangkok. Without further uh, ado, I would like to invite Ms. Christine, uh, United Nations Resident Coordinator at Interim, to deliver her welcome remarks. Christine, please. Thank you very much. Um, His Excellency Rosil Lava, Secretary of State, Ministry of Economic and Economy and Finance, Excellencies Ambassadors, representatives from ministries, development partners, UN agencies, international and local NGOs, representatives from research institutions, private sectors and associations, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, good afternoon. I am pleased to welcome you all to the launch of the Cambodia Development Finance Assessment Report. On behalf of UN Cambodia, it is my honor to deliver the opening remarks in the launch of this report. I would like to thank the Joint SDG Fund for investing in the Integrated National Financing Framework Joint Programs, which enabled us to produce the DFA report as an output assessing the current development finance landscape and identify opportunities for elaborating the financial, the financing of sustainable development in Cambodia. I would also like to convey my deepest appreciation to the Ministry of Economy and Finance, and especially to His Excellency Rose Selava for his leadership as the co-chair of the steering committee in the implementation of UN SDG financing portfolio of joint programs to join us today. I am also grateful for her Excellency Chess Rai, Dr. Cheng Vanerit, and Dr. Radhika Lal, who will be contributing their insights in the panel discussion as part of the launch event. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in the course of this launch event, we will hear more about the report from the presentation and the panel discussion. Prior to do so, let me emphasize that the overarching objective of the DFA study is to provide the Royal Government of Cambodia 
with an overview of development finance flows available to support investment climate in the country. The report provides general policy recommendations to support national development priorities of the Royal Government of Cambodia, and specifically a few key recommendations outlined to the Ministry of Economy and Finance to maximize the level of financial flows and their quality and allocation in order to deliver on long-run development objectives, as well as on advancing the Cambodia Sustainable Development Goals. The COVID-19 pandemic has hit many developing countries hard, including Cambodia. The current emergency situation and the serious financial implications might potentially create debt burden and financial losses, which require us to act swiftly and anticipate near future and future policy implications to protect the economy and the most marginalized. Today's event provides an opportunity for continuing discussion among the government agencies, development partners, key relevant stakeholders, including private sectors who join us today in order to further support the Royal Government of Cambodia's effort in building forward better from the pandemic crisis and accelerating the achievement of Cambodia's SDGs. The pandemic has triggered setbacks to social and economic outcomes of Cambodia and countries around the world. The Cambodian economy contracted by 3.4% in 2020. Poverty rate is estimated to have increased significantly. And thanks to the Royal Government of Cambodia's swift social protection measures, including the cash transfer program, millions of people were prevented from falling into deeper poverty and the economy was protected from dropping into a larger contraction. Amidst these disruptions, for all of us who are here, we believe the pandemic crisis is an opportunity for transformation. Since the past year, we are stepping into a new era of challenges and transformations. This crisis gives us an opportunity to create transformative policies in social protection and universal health care. It also reminds us that we might not be able to go back to business as usual, but creates a new future for the next generation. To truly implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, economic, social, and environmental priorities, we must be aligned with sustainable financial flows and policies. Thus, it is critical to broaden the development financing landscape through innovative financing tools and mechanisms in order to unlock the transformations required to move forward better towards a more inclusive and greener future. These innovative financing tools, including impact investment, public-private partnerships, enterprise challenge fund, biodiversity finance, green and blue, fund, blue bonds, and the corporate social responsibility law are explored and detailed in the DFA report. In the medium to long run, there is a need for an integrated approach to financing. UN, along with the Royal Government of Cambodia, are reassessing our medium term priorities with a focus on interconnected investment areas that can deliver multiple long term benefits for greener, gender equitable, more inclusive and more resilient development. Thematic priorities such as climate and environmental issues, equality, gender equality and inclusivity, job creation, health and social protection, among others, are emerging in many national contexts. Implementing the new generation of national plans that can advance these priorities and build forward better will require robust financing strategies. In order to support robust financing strategies, as well as to diversify, innovate, and sustain financing for national development objectives and the Cambodia's SDGs, the UN commits to working closely with the Royal Government of Cambodia and other partners, and among our support, the Integrated National Financing Framework, or we call INFF, will allow the government to build a demand-driven financing framework, enable the expansion of uh, development resources and implement a sound financing strategy.
The DFA is an analytical tool to help us shape the inception phase in the process of operationalizing an INFF. I believe that with the proper use of financing, we will be able to help improve the lives of the Cambodian, achieve the SDGs and develop sustainably so that all Cambodians can enjoy peace and prosperity. Finally, I'd like to re reiterate the UN's call for international cooperation in combating the COVID-19 pandemic. No one person or organization can achieve ambitious goals of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development on their own, especially now when the stakes are really high. As a result, your participation in this launch demonstrate your commitment for further enhancing collaboration and we need swift, agile and collective action to resource and finance the recovery from the pandemic while also accelerating Cambodia's progress towards the SDGs. This is one of the opportunities to work together to support the royal government's transformative policies. I trust that the event will make a useful contribution as it shares the results and policy recommendations and serves as a discussion platform. And I look forward to the panel discussion and question and answer session. Thank you, Christine. For your uh, for clearly uh, highlighting the objective of the DFA report, uh, as well as your insightful uh, welcome remarks. Uh, next, I would like to invite um, Excellency Rosilova, Secretary of State, Ministry of Economy and Finance, to deliver the opening remark. Please, Excellency. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Christine Paco, uh, resident coordinator AI of the UN in Cambodia, Excellency Ambassador, representative uh, from development partner UN agency, international and local NGO, representative from research institution, private sector and association, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Today, it is my honor and great pleasure to be here with all of you uh, virtually to deliver this opening remark in the official launch of the UNDP report on Cambodia Development Finance Assessment. At the outset, I would like to congratulate UNDP on the effort to produce this report I would like to extend my warmest welcome and appreciation to all Excellency and colleagues from the UN country team, relevant government ministry, development partner, civil society, private sector, and other stakeholders who spare your busy schedule to join us today in this Friday afternoon. Uh, Cambodia Development Finance as assessment report is another contribution of UNDP to provide evidence-based policy recommendation for the local government of Cambodia. In this specific case, uh, to finance our goal and ambition of achieving CSDG and upper middle income status by 2030. The report is timely and relevant considering the implementation of uh, the nine round of economic and social intervention measure by the Royal government of Cambodia to respond to COVID-19, as well as the upcoming post-COVID recovery plan to recover, reform, and build resilience for our economy and society. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, in light of uh, the analysis in the report, I would like to acknowledge the significance of this report and would like to take this opportunity to reflect uh, on three key insights I follow. First, uh, the report highlights the current and potential medium-term flow of uh, development resources of Cambodia. 
I believe that the analysis on current life resource flow and funding priorities such as public resources, ODA, domestic, private investment, API, and remittances could shed light on our development progress in the past decade. The projection of future trend of these development resources and the assessment of the impact of uh, COVID-19 on major financing flow are very crucial to inform evidence-based policy making. In addition, the report also provides us the, signi the significant gap and uh, strategic direction to have other financing opportunity to utilize beyond public finance resources. Second, Cambodia to, uh, plan to launch uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, economic recovery plan 2021-2023. Uh, 20, and the COVID-19 pandemic is far from over. Uh, we will put our best effort to take it as an opportunity to transform our social economic structure to be more diversified, sustainable, and inclusive to build a resilient, healthy public finance. The recovery plan will be financed by public resources while considering other options of financial resources to mobilize more resources. Thus, I am of the view that this report will provide us some insight into those options. Meanwhile, fight, uh, fighting against COVID-19 is always our top uh, agenda. In particular, the government spending has uh, been uh, increased significantly through implementing the stimulus package to help uh, the economy and vulnerable people, uh, while the revenue collection has been negatively affected. As a result, the Royal Government of Cambodia through the Ministry of Economy and Finance have been working very actively to identify and attract new sustainable financing sources to meet our increasing need of development. I uh, also raised uh, this particular point during the launch of the UN Joint, Pro uh, the UN Joint Program uh, in April. Third, I uh, welcome and uh, resonate uh, policy recommendation given in the DFA report, such as strengthening revenue collection capability and mechanism, accelerating expansion of domestic lending or borrowing instrument, restoring the level of ATI and private domestic investment, and further implementation of blended financing. The recommendations are aligned with what the Royal Government of Cambodia have been doing. At the same time, more need to be done. There are still some room for improvement and collaboration with uh, relevant stakeholders to be more efficiently and effectively effect, uh, implemented. I observe that the report also identifies some innovative financing tools, including the PPP, impact bond, SDG bond, biofin, and so on and so forth. Thus, this launch even is a, an a, a invaluable opportunity for all relevant stakeholders to understand more on the trajectory of development finance in Cambodia. I encourage stakeholders to understand more, uh, uh, encourage every, everyone here to work together to explore uh, the potential further uh, to generate more financing options for, for Cambodia. Last but not least, I would like to congratulate uh, to uh, UNDP once again uh, on the launch of this uh, important uh, report. I am pleased to reaffirm that uh, Ministry of Economy and Finance uh, stand ready to work with the uh, UN Cambodia and all stakeholders to mobilize more resources to finance our development trajectory. On behalf of the 
uh, Ministry of Economy and Finance, I uh, really appreciate and I firmly believe that uh, participants will actively uh, participate in the panel discussion so that we can hear your view to better calibrate our understanding on the, the topic. The COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, surely does uh, set us back, but uh, collective action collaboration among government agency, development partner, private sector and Cambodian citizen will definitely bring us back on the right track to move forward toward our 2030 agenda. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, I wish all of you a fruitful discussion. Uh, so uh, stay safe, uh, stay healthy during this uh, tough time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency, for sharing key insights about the government plans as well as about the reports. Uh, next, I would like to invite Dr. Pam Gonsinarat to present some key findings of the reports. Thank you, um, Dr. Gonsinarat. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Rani, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Excellency Rosalawa, Secretary of State, uh, Ministry of Economy and Finance, Excellency Chiesarei, Assistant Governor of the National Bank of Cambodia, Ms. Christine Paco, UN uh, United Nations uh, Resident uh, Coordinator AI, Mr. Nick uh, Beresport, Resident Representative of the UNDP Cambodia, Excellency, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure today to uh, present the key finding from a UNDP recent study on uh, Cambodia development uh, financing assessment, the study which analyzed the flow of uh, private, uh, public, and uh, domestic and international uh, financial resource available to uh, finance the development of Cambodia. And it also presents some uh, policy option uh, on how to maximize the level of flow as well as uh, the co quality and allocation in order to achieve a long-term development uh, objective. So in my presentation today, I will cover uh, five points. Uh, financing instru financial instrument, uh, development financing status up to uh, 2019 and analysis of the trend and uh, of development financing and impact of the COVID-19. And the fourth point is uh, innovative financing tool for uh, 2030. And the final point is uh, policy option. <clears throat> so uh, financing instrument in Cambodia became uh, divided into uh, four broad block uh, public domestic which consists of uh, domestic revenue uh, public international uh, which consists of loan grant and climate fund private domestic consists of domestic private investment uh, remittance of cambodian worker from abroad uh, disbursement of the uh, local ngo private and international uh, block consists of uh, fdi and uh, international NGO disbursement. So the next slide we will uh, see uh, uh, each flow in more detail. So the, the first one is domestic uh, revenue. Domestic revenue, as you can see from the graph, is dominated by indirect tax, uh, take up around uh, half of the pie, followed by uh, direct tax, uh, non-tax revenues and international trade tax, which uh, represent 19.2, uh, 12.7, and 10.3% of the total uh, domestic revenue, respectively. And thanks to the uh, reform in the past, uh, tax 
revenue collection uh, has been increased dramatically from 10% of GDP in 2010 to 19.7% of GDP in 2019. And this made Cambodia one of the best performer in the region. And uh, going forward, uh, we need to maybe introduce uh, new tax as a uh, tax or increase uh, the rate of tax for some items such as alcohol, uh, tobacco, or gambling. We can also consider uh, uh, issuing uh, the bond in Khmeril uh, to improve the domestic uh, revenue and to improve the uh, monetary policy too as well. So for foreign direct investment flow, uh, it's been growing very fast in the past uh, 10 years, uh, reaching around one uh, 3.4 billion US dollar uh, uh, in 2019, uh, accounting for around 12.7 of the GDP. But uh, FDI in Cambodia is mainly coming from a country in the region, uh, such as China, Hong Kong, Japan, and we have uh, around one fourth from the UK. And these FDI flow concentrate mainly in uh, real estate, tourism, and common industry. And uh, moving forward, uh, maybe Cambodia can no longer rely on uh, cheap labor uh, as a competitive advantage to attract FDI. So, uh, uh, it's more need to be done to uh, bring down the cost of doing business and, and, and to improve the labor productivity. Uh, so for the uh, domestic private investment flow, uh, it's also growing uh, very fast from 500 million US dollar in 2001 to around 2 billion uh, US dollar in uh, 2019. And uh, the, bar, uh, the line uh, bow show the total private investment. Uh, it show GDP. Uh, total private investment consists of both uh, FDI and domestic private investment. Uh, and in 2019, uh, uh, the ratio of uh, total private investment to GDP is around 22.5%. Uh, this is still uh, low if we compare to Thailand uh, or Malaysia uh, in the 1990s when they experienced very high growth rate. And also uh, to China in uh, 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 to early 2000, which uh, uh, the level of uh, private investment uh, is around 40% of the GDP. And uh, maybe uh, government should also uh, uh, incentivize uh, domestic investor to invest more on uh, the productive sector away from, from uh, real estate. Uh, producing uh, good at good, uh, good qualities and at the competitive price may require a uh, high level of technologies and, and also uh, learning by doing process. So strong support uh, from the government will be uh, crucial uh, to make this thing happen. Uh, the next flow is emitten. Emitten uh, emerged as a significant source of ODA, uh, uh, it's equal to ODA flow as of uh, 2019. And according to the Ministry of uh, Labor, uh, there's around uh, 1.3 million uh, Cambodian workers abroad in 2019. And the World Bank uh, report estimate that the uh, uh, remittance uh, inflow from abroad uh, to Cambodia was around uh, 1.6 billion uh, US dollar, accounting for 5.7% uh, of the GDP uh, in 2019. This is 
really a very big uh, uh, flow and uh, we hope that uh, after uh, COVID-19, after uh, all the current music and uh, uh, Remittance will uh, continue to play the uh, significant role for uh, Cambodia. And the next flow is uh, ODA. ODA uh, to Cambodia has been increasing in absolute term, but uh, declining as a share of GDP. This is something that we uh, expected uh, as the side of economy is growing and uh, ODA donor need to divert their attention and resource to less developed uh, economy and more vulnerable uh, as compared to Cambodia. And uh, the next flow is the climate fund related flow. Uh, it relatively small, but keep growing. It's grow from uh, 200. 95 million uh, US dollar in 2015 to uh, 567 million US dollar in 2019. And the next flow is NGO flow. Uh, it's been growing uh, up to 2015 and then uh, relatively stay relatively stable uh, afterward. And uh, NGO fund is mostly concentrated on uh, social sectors such as uh, health and education. So uh, this uh, graph summarizes the evolution of the main flow, uh, including those that can be directly programmed by the government, uh, as well as those outside the uh, public sector that are hard the, to manage. So all financing flow are growing, as you can see from the graph growing very fast. Uh, but some were interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic while domestic private financing still uh, will become the key financing uh, in the futures. And according to our forecast, uh, Total financial uh, potential available for supporting uh, national development could uh, be around uh, 23.4 uh, billion US dollar by 2025. And as a share of GDP, uh, it could rise to 69.8%. Uh, uh, it's mainly uh, driven by domestic revenue, FDI, uh, domestic private investment emittance. So this table uh, summarized COVID-19 impact on the flows. COVID-19 has led to a total financial flow loss uh, around 3.6 billion US dollar, uh, accounting for 19.8% uh, of the total flow in uh, 2020. And uh, the most significant affected financial source include uh, domestic revenue, FDI, uh, domestic private investment, and remittance, uh, declined by 23.6%, 31.0%, 16.3%, and 20.2%, respectively. So moving forward, uh, Cambodia may need uh, to engage more uh, uh, in innovative financing tool for uh, 2030 agenda. And this uh, include the planned financing, uh, what we call private pub, uh, private public private partnership, the green bonds, impact investing, biofin, enterprise challenge fund, and social. Uh, uh, Corporate responsibility. Uh, these tools are not new actually uh, to Cambodia. Some of them uh, has been used, such as uh, public private partnership, uh, impact investing, enterprise challenge uh, fund. And some are new, such as green bond. Uh, but uh, we think that uh, this tool will be uh, good uh, to mobilize resource. 
uh, for the development in the future. And a final point, a policy recommendation, we uh, divide it into uh, short term and, and medium to long term. For the short term, we have uh, three main points to recommend. First, uh, strengthen revenue collection capacity and mechanism through engaging the uh, tax inspector with our border to make sure uh, multinational and other large company are paying their fair share of the tax. Two, uh, accelerate expansion of domestic lending instrument, uh, bond issue, and, uh, issue in Mario uh, would also help liberalize the economy and expand monetary policy option. And uh, third, restore the level of uh, FDI and private domestic investment. So providing credit guarantee to firm, especially SME, and examine the use of tax concession to boost FDI and domestic investment. And fourth point, also important, investing uh, in social protection to prevent people from sliding back uh, into poverty. And this also can help stimulate the economy. And for the, the medium to longer term, uh, we have uh, four uh, key points to uh, recommend as well. First, uh, consider implementation of sin tax, uh, tax on gambling, tobacco, alcohol, as well as other tax, the social and uh, environmental positive externality. Actually, uh, according to our recent study uh, by UNDP as well, released last month, uh, the main cause of uh, traffic a road traffic accident is uh, drunk driving. So uh, if we uh, impose uh, sin tax on alcohol, this can also uh, save life as well as it's reviewed for the government. And the second point is the further implementation of land financing. The third point is engage in the innovative financing mechanism such as uh, green uh, climate change financing, uh, green bond, SDG bond, impact investment, and biofin, et cetera. And the last one is to improve the capacity uh, building and institutional chain to better facilitate and oversee the ongoing expansion of the private sector flow uh, with a focus on delivering higher quality investment. So thank you for uh, your attention. That's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rasinarat. I think you are very good uh, uh, in managing your time. Uh, thank you so much. And without uh, further ado, uh, I would like to give the floor to Nick uh, to moderate the panel discussion. Uh, but um, uh, before that, let me emphasize again, um, we will share the QR code and the link at the end of the Q&A session, uh, which you can download the full report. Uh, and we also share the presentation in the chat box uh, uh, after the Q&A session. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I give the floor to you, Nick, please. Thank you, Rani. Uh, thank you, Narit, for a great presentation. Um, and. Uh, uh, a, a really strong report, lots of interesting stuff in there, and I, I think useful stuff in guiding us on uh, policy direction and ways to get creative, and particularly in our response to COVID and how we might be able to pull out of COVID uh, stronger, better on, on a higher development pathway as well. Um, let me take the opportunity to uh, pay my respects also to His Excellency Ross Salavar, the Secretary of State of the Ministry of Economy and Finance. Uh, thank you, Excellency, for joining us. And also to my colleague, Christine Parco, the United Nations Resident Coordinator um, AI. Um, we have a great panel for you this afternoon, and I'm going to introduce each panel member as I come to the questions. And if I may, um, I would like to start with Her Excellency Chia Saray. I think just about everybody on the call, most people will know uh, who Excellency Chia Saray is. She's the Assistant Governor and Director General of the Central Banking and National Bank of Cambodia. 
Um, the uh, central bank was quick to act when the COVID crisis happened in easing requirements and uh, other stimulus measures. Um, XNC GSRA has also been a leading light in, in innovation, particularly in the financial uh, sphere. The Bang Kong digital platform is uh, a, a good example of that. So XNC, thank you very much for joining us. And I, I want, if I may, then to start maybe with a more general question, which is uh, looking at the presentation, there's quite a lot in there. There's quite a lot of, um, uh, there's some major movements, uh, both positive and negative. What were some of the features that uh, uh, that struck you? What are the kind of opportunities, threats and opportunities that you can see for uh, Cambodia moving forward in development finance assistance flows? Over to you, Excellency. Thank you, uh, Nick. Thank you, UNDP, for having me and congratulations to UNDP for publishing this report. I have a few questions on, on the data, but I'll take it offline later. Um, so, Generally speaking, and, and let's, let's just keep this general and not specifically on a report. What I see standing out during this period of COVID is a mentality shift. Um, people are more aware of their surrounding. Now we can talk about sustainable financing, we can talk about green financing, but if people, and we have all the rules in place, all the evidence that we may have, but if people don't believe in it, then the implementation will not happen. Um, and I mean, just by way of, of, of uh, sort of uh, illustration, and this is an example, if people don't believe that COVID is dangerous, despite the evidence that was put out, then they're not going to wear a mask. And it's the same way if people don't believe that there are climate change, you may have all this rule and this financing too, people are not going to implement this. But what I observed during this time, again, as I said, there's more awareness of the surroundings. And I look at my Facebook news feeds all the time, so I have more times at home now. What I saw is that people are starting to explore the country much more than before. They start to enjoy, you know, ecological sight more. Uh, they go hiking, they go picnicking. And that's for me is, is a good sign because I do see how people start to appreciate, uh, you know, the, the, the green environment around them. And, and so this for me is, is something that I think is very uh, positive uh, going forward. In terms of the opportunities, uh, again, I, I relate to this, I think it will be easier to convince people to do uh, and, and to, to, to invest or maybe to consume responsibly towards sustainability. Um, I think also um, that um, in, in the report that we're mentioning about um, new financing tools that uh, we could explore and some of them are existent, uh, some exist but not properly structured, uh, such as blended finance. Um, I, I can see that uh, coming in to address some of the threats that uh, we are facing right now with, you know, a lot of pressure on fiscal uh, spending. Uh, we've, we've got, you know, slow economic growth, we've got our uh, tax collections is, um, is not doing as good as we hope it would uh, because of this uh, economic slowdown. But the government has also to spend more in terms of assisting the, uh, the, 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 the COVID patients and on all the measures that we need. And so going forward, there, there's a sort of it, and it's very difficult in terms of, you know, what priorities, you know, you have the health of the people, you have inequality that is more striking now, but at the same time, you have to think about the climate change. And so if, if the government has to tackle all these at the same time, then I think there would need uh, a, a, a different sorts of funding. Obviously, concessional loan is, 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 is going to dry out eventually as the country moves towards uh, a middle income country. Um, so the report has already pointed out that we, we need to look at domestic funding, uh, for instance, uh, raising a local, uh, raising bonds locally. Um, and, and from the central bank, I would certainly add on that we would prefer local currency bond. Um, also, in terms of blended finance, I think it's a very interesting concept because, again, come out from this COVID situation, what we saw is that there's a lot of uh, philanthropy. So blended finance, for those of you who's not familiar with, is, is a concept where you blend 
fund from philanthropic fund, uh, fund from the private sector, and fund from the government sector all together to fund a sustainable project. And in a way, it's it's good because if you look at if you just leave it alone to government and philanthropic, maybe we can overlook the sustainability part and we'll just focus on the social part and it may not be good in the long run. So you bring in the, the private sector because they have fun, but they also uh, sort of more sustainable minded. So you, you sort of marry these uh, sort of two, um, two part together. Also, I, I believe that for government to sort of throw into a uh, solely into a project, it, there's also reputational cost to be factored in. So if you bring in, uh, bring in blend, um, a philanthropic fund and private sector, in a way, it's a resharing uh, this um, sort of uh, framework. And I think what I've observed from during this COVID is that there's a lot of now people who are willing to help. Um, who realize that, you know, um, especially those who, who are in the higher uh, um, income threshold um, are donating, uh, they want to do something, but uh, we, we just need to frame it properly so that, you know, these funds go into strategic investment uh, for the benefit of the country. Um, so that's my take on, on your first question, Nick. Back to you. Excellent teacher, Syria. Thank you very much. I, I, I want a quick follow up question because there's a lot of interesting stuff there. And one, one of the ones I wanted to uh, maybe follow up with, if, if, if the other panelists will allow me, is, um, you know, you talked about, the, you know, why aren't we doing more in creative green financing, for example, and, you know, and I, I and that's something that also um, is to some extent a puzzle to me and to, and to many others as well. If you look at the recovery from COVID globally, it's not a green financing investment recovery. And the mystery to me is sometimes is, is that with many of those options actually falling in price, the, the, the argument is both economic, social, health, and everything, it's all aligned. And, and yet we still, you know, and, and I, I, I'm not so naive as to realize that there's not some kind of political economy issues in there as well. But I'm wondering like from, a, from the Cambodia, Cambodia point of view, how might we stimulate or how might we, we, we uh, um, provide the incentives for stronger, uh, more creative uh, financing flows within, within green financing? Yeah, I think, um, to, to be honest, I think there's, there's a lot of awareness now, as I mentioned earlier about, um, you know, people wanting to be more ecological in their spending and their consumptions. The problem with green financing is that there's not enough data so if I'm an investor and I want to, to invest in a project, a green project here in Cambodia, there's very little data. And even not just not Cambodia, but around the world, there's, there's very little data to, to compare and see. And, and as you, you rightly pointed out, it's, it's also about the economics of it. Um, but having said that, the, 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 the bankers associations in Cambodia has been uh, quite forthcoming. They have uh, become, they just, uh, I think about two, three years ago, they signed an MOU and become a member of the uh, network for greening of the financial system. And they are now working um, with various uh, international donors to build the capacity of the bank staff. So it's good to have rules and regulations, but the people, I mean, the rules and guidelines, but the people need to be able to identify and assess the risk of who they are financing. And, and this, again, it takes time. Um, also, the National Bank of Cambodia has also signed MOU with the uh, this is a, a tripartite uh, MOU signing with the Ministry of Environment and the Bankers Association on information sharing. I think uh, this also has been a good start and and set the uh, the ground for you know understanding each other. There there are things and you know there are things that is important for the environment but may not necessarily uh, feasible from a prudential perspective. So we need to understand each other goals um, and, and, and work together towards that. Um, I think that's, that's one, one thing that we have been trying to do, but at the National Bank of Cambodia particularly, we're very cautious also about how we invest our foreign exchange reserve, for instance, where we, um, we make sure that we invest uh, in a sustainable instrument. Uh, the thing that has frustrated me is that I mean, we are very, we're one of the first central bank in the world to invest in the BIS green bonds when it was first issued. 
And so my question back to my team was that, how can I get that fund back into Cambodia, back into the region where we desperately need? Um, and there's no real answer to that. So this is something that I think organizations like the UNDP or the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank can come in where, you know, I central bank has foreign exchange reserve. We need to invest it somewhere. But because of the IMF, you know, definitions and restrictions on, you know, what is qualified as a foreign exchange reserve that can be used in time of crisis, we, there is specification on the instrument that we can uh, invest. And that can be, you know, it has to be very good rating and it has to be uh, liquid, et cetera. So if this is something, a bond that is, in, that is issued by organizations like, you know, UNDP or World Bank, we have very uh, strong rating, then this will be something that the central bank can invest in. Uh, but then at the same time, we also want to see those investments coming back into the country uh, or perhaps into the region. Um, so I think this is an opportunity that has not yet been explored, but I would love to see uh, uh, further uh, sort of studies into this. Excellency, thank you. I, I was going to go to uh, Dr. Chiang Banneret, and, and Banneret, if you'll forgive me, because Excellency Chia Suri has turned that question back to UN and UNDP, um, uh, uh, the, the challenge is there. I, I think then, then maybe I can ask, if I can bring in uh, Dr. Radhika Lal, uh, my colleague on this, because um, and, you know, I think you raised the issue quite rightly uh, about if you want to stimulate that green investment, and if that green investment actually does make sense, you know, developmentally, in, in terms of human development, economically, socially, and so on, you know, and it's about a lack of data, for example, it's um, about, um, you know, a, a, a maybe the need for more creativity in the in, in the times of instruments that we're kind of creating and policies, you know, wh wh what's the role then for, for, for us in the UN, for other development partners or other others who are interested and motivated to want to make this, uh, these green investments um, um, work? Um, so, Radhika, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Nick, and, and thank you, Deputy uh, Governor. I think there are two things uh, there that I see um, that are interconnected. One, it's clear that, um, you know, having a dollarization means that a lot of your reserves, as you said, are tied up uh, and that you can't use them or Cambodia can't use them the way that it would like. Um, and so on one hand, um, you know, measures that you're adopting to, to de-dollarize also bring back some of those reserves for you to use uh, and not for the international financial system to benefit. Um, and then it's a question of really looking at what does it take to build up, um, um, you know, the green, green bond market, if you like, because it's not just issuing the financing and designing the financing instrument. But as you said, having data, building up a portfolio of projects, um, you know, that uh, investors can, then can invest in. And this is where, you know, the fact that Cambodia benefits a lot from impact investment, but there could be a move then to tap into that and say, why is so much of it going, for example, to microfinance? And what could be done to start engaging um, those types of investors to start with more with energy, with digitalization, with other things. Um, and that's where UNDP can be helpful. We can't uh, issue bonds, but we can come in at the pre and post issuance phases and really help uh, with the development of the portfolios, help with the impact reporting. Um, and help with the change in mindsets that you talked about. Because this is not, um, it doesn't mean, a green bond doesn't mean, I think we, we're all coming to that realization that it's going to be easy or that you'll see an immediate pricing advantage. So really this is something that's medium term, that's looking at how do we get investment and financing you know, into sustainable development priorities. So that's the first thing. And once that, that, that change is made, that mind shift change is made towards that, you start to get investors who are, are willing to be there, who are more patient, who are willing to be there for the longer haul. And you, you can diversify and you see less fluctuations. So really that's the kind of, um, you know, if you like, full set of areas that we can support. 
is with the design of the instrument, with the portfolio development, with making the case of what you can and cannot do through this and why it's not a, an immediate fix. And I think maybe, Nick, that's one reason why we are not seeing as much focus on green finance, if you like, um, in the developing uh, countries, because it takes time to, to actually do that. And for countries which are looking for immediate ways of plugging their fiscal holes, for lack of a better word, um, you know, it's not the first thing that you can do. Over. Radhika, thank you. And um, yeah, so that th there's uh, there's plenty of work for us to do. And then um, I'm also pleased to say that we're already in a partnership with National Bank of Cambodia, working closely with Excellency Chiasere on many of these issues, and also with Ministry of Economy and Finance. I want to bring in now uh, Dr. Chiang Vanaret, uh, the president of the Asia Vision Institute. I mean. Um, uh, Vanarit, we were talking about um, the, uh, uh, this report um, some time ago, and, and I'm really pleased that we're, you, you're able to join us into, into this panel discussion. Maybe I'd like to actually maybe continue the conversation as, as, as we're going now. I mean, um, I think Radhika brings up a very interesting point about the fact that you do see a lot of investment coming in into a sort of quasi-banking system, which goes into microfinancing, which from an investor point of view from outside the country is actually quite interesting returns. And then, but you don't see it necessarily going into other development projects into the same extent. And that this maybe goes back to Excellency Chia Sarayan's point about, you know, we need, we need more kind of shovel ready projects maybe to come in that are ready, that can absorb funds that are set up into these bonds. I mean, how do you see how we might be able to, you know, both on the supply side of the projects that are ready, but then also then on the financing side, the instrument side, the bond side, be able to, you know, both push forward a development agenda, but also a green development agenda, um, you know, in, uh, in countries like Cambodia. Thank, thank you, Nick, and uh, thank you for the opportunities. I, I really enjoyed the remarks by Dr. Bill Chiesere. He uh, always uh, inspired me, you know, uh, in terms of uh, vision, uh, and very practical uh, kind of step uh, forward. Okay, uh, concerning your your question, I I think we, we need to look at it from quite a holistic approach. Um, first, uh, regulate regulatory regime. Uh, do we have uh, a regulatory uh, frameworks to encourage the investment? Not only to encourage, but to protect the investment in uh, let's say impact project, social impact project or green projects? Do they trust our legal system? Uh, that, that is the most important because I have uh, met with several Japanese investors. What they complain is the legal system uh, in Cambodia, right? The regulatory system, whether they are protected, uh, we are, whether they enjoy fair competition. Uh, uh, by the way, I think the National Assembly now is uh, is uh, kind of discussing ratifying competition law. So let, let's see, you know, this kind of uh, regulatory environment, whether it, it will encourage more uh, foreign investor in particular to, to Cambodia. Second, of course, there's, it's about, uh, to some extent, it's about um, uh, incentive kind of investment returns, right? Uh, do, do we have uh, a kind of uh, a set of incentive and investment returns? Now investment law is being uh, revised. I think it will be uh, reduced, I mean, released soon, right? The investment law providing to have more incentive. But I, I'm not sure whether those incentives related to the green investment or impact investment, I don't know because we haven't seen the, the amended investment law yet. So wait and see. Uh, but I, I'm not sure whether the during the amendment process or investment law, they all also consult with different stakeholder Especially when it comes to the SDG financing and you know uh, goals, SDG goal and so on. Uh, my, my third point, I, I very much uh, share the perspective uh, looking to yesterday is about also about behavior insight, behavior change, and behavior insight. Uh, and this comes to the the domestic investors, right? So look at the domestic investor; they they want to have quick returns. Well, many of them involved in let's say real estates or or those kind of uh, non-manufacturing, you know, sector. So, so how we can change this mindset of Cambodian investors? Some of them already have hundreds of million US dollar 
to uh, draw their attention to in, uh, invest in this green uh, and, and social impact investment. So that in, involves about value, reputations, the legacy of your life, the meaning of your life, what you want to achieve in your life. You know, uh, you need to do something uh, meaningful, uh, socially impactful uh, for the society. At least you, uh, you don't uh, produce so much carbon footprint, but you need to do something. You know? <laughs> Uh, to, to this is about a uh, 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 kind of behavior change, uh, mindset, and uh, mentality. So I think it's a quite holistic approach to what this. Thank you, Ben. Right, thank you. And I, I, I like the point about our values. Also, I mean, I guess our values also should be driving the policies, the laws, the regulations that we put in, so that hopefully these these, these two have these good connection, so that we want to be able, you know, uh, um, you know, and particularly uh, intergenerational equity. You know, this idea that. Uh, the, you know the, the the world that we live to our children to our grandchildren you know um, um, is uh, the prosperity for them is also guaranteed and that the investments are not so short term that we effectively are taking away from future generations because of our over exploitation um, I wanted maybe to come back to Excellency um, uh, Chia Sere on, on also on the point that Radhika raised as well on um, the, the question of, uh, of U.S. dollars versus local currency, and, uh, and, and in fact, Excellency, you mentioned yourself, you know, that um, when it comes to like looking at more domestic financing. So one of the things our report says is that we can see the importance of domestic financing, which I think actually is a positive development. It's not just the fact that we get a lot more money coming in, but the 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 the, the, uh, the makeup of that money changes, and within that domestic financing is more. more I think um, uh, opportunity for self-determination. Uh, there's more, um, and there's opportunities also for how you create your own financing systems. And um, I, I'm wondering if you could say uh, a little bit more about how the National Bank of Cambodia sees these opportunities and these developments moving forward. Yeah, but uh, first of all, thank you, Nick, for the question. First of all, I just want to point out, you know, we, we, we tend to talk interchangeably between, you know, opportunity for sustainable financing, but not green financing. I just want to make sure that sustainable financing encompass also green financing. So there, there are sustainable financing, for instance, in terms of improving people's life, access to clean water. Organizations like water.org has channeled their funding through microfinance to help people you know, build a clean water facility. There's also organizations that channel their fund through microfinance to help people build a uh, latrine. Um, but indeed, there is a lack of financing in the green a project per se, and as I said, there's a lot of, of data that is lacking, and it is a matter of, you know, chicken and eggs. If you, you think you would think that you know, if there's a good project, the money will come, but then you say, well, if there's um, the money, and and but then the, the project will say, if there's no money, I'm not going to start anything. Um, so so this this is something that uh, um, I, I I don't have a solution, but just needed to point it out. Um, on the questions about dollarization, this is also. Um, I mean, it, it's a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. Um, being a dollarized certainly has sort of helped us uh, maintain our stability in terms of, you know, uh, um, inflation rate, et cetera. And it it's provide more confidence to investors, uh, but also it limits the central bank uh, tools to help the, uh, the economy in, in time of crisis, for instance. Um, I mean, you've seen, you've read the news all the times where you see central bank of this country has been doing this and that, and, and, and it has a lot of implications on the uh, money supply in the whole economy. In our case, it's very, we, we don't know how to do that. We can control the supply um, of uh, KHR, which is the local currency, but we can't control the supply of, uh, say, US dollars. Um, so that, that's something that we really need to, to uh, to think about when we discuss about uh, domestic uh, financing. Um, I, I, I believe that there, there are plenty of opportunities uh, for uh, raising funding uh, locally, um, for, 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 for the government to raise fund locally, also for investors uh, to raise fund locally. The problem again, um, and then I mean, I, it, and then it kept coming more and more. Is 
it's more the understanding of, of the risk from the investors. First of all, you have investors who've not used to capital markets, um, who don't understand how it works and very hesitant to do it uh, through the capital markets. Uh, so there's need more awareness. Second of all, in terms of the uh, local currency financing, um, people don't yet understand. And, and we're talking about when, when I discussed to Ben, we're talking about you know, people who um, sort of put themselves in an exposure of foreign currency without understanding their, uh, the currency of their income and, and having a big currency mismatch in there. Um, so this is something that it's, it's, um, it's work in progress. There is no sort of magic bullet that we can solve. Uh, we are trying to educate the people to understand the benefit of using local currency um, for the long term. Um, but uh, going, I mean, just an example for now in another country, um, let's say if there's an immediate in Bank of Japan, the central bank can release liquidity to the markets by even buying uh, corporate bonds, right? Um, in Cambodia, there is a, it's quite limited in the way what the central bank can do. Um, and if, you know, we, we're working hard to try to convince corporate to issue bonds in local currency, but there are already those who, you know, try to convince, uh, um, you know, other authorities that, you know, it's better for them to issue in US dollars. So if, if you know, everyone issue US dollars, there's, there's not much that the central bank can do because our holding in US dollars is also limited. It's, it's not um, sort of uh, uh, indefinite, whereas, you know, local currency, put it in a plain word is that we can print the money ourselves, right? So, yeah, so um, I hope I answer your question on that. Yes, thank you. This is a huge subject and I, and I realize it's not something that we're going to be doing justice to uh, in, in the short term, uh, the short period that we have to, um, uh, before us, but um, absolutely, you know, the, the, uh, the ability to have a full monetary policy um, um, must be something that uh, I think increasingly uh, a fast growing middle income country is going to want to have that policy lever more and more, you know, the ability, as you say, to print money when it's appropriate, you know, it is, um, um, it, it's an important, um, yeah, it's an important option, I would say. I, we have some questions in the chat box, so I'm going to start to bring in some questions from um, um, uh, participants, and um, and the first question I've got is um, from David Van, and actually David's got at least three questions. I'm going to take the first one, which is on the syntax idea, which is one of the policy recommendations that we picked up on. Some work that we've done with WHO and the Ministry of Health just before COVID broke, actually, about huge opportunities to both lower mortality um, and to substantially raise revenues through uh, higher taxations on, for example, tobacco products. But um, abs absolutely concur, but not insufficient as all relevant authorities must also shut down hard the toxic advertising authorized in promoting drinking habits seen daily in TV programs, etc. Yeah, I mean, good point. When I'm driving, when I, one of the first things that struck me when I came to Cambodia and I was driving down the highways is, is, is that, that, you know, every 60 seconds there's an advert for a beer, which you don't often see in, in, in uh, other highways. I mean, you know, we've just done some work on um, uh, the loss of life in traffic accidents. And uh, we had a huge data set of more than 80,000 accidents, including fatalities. And when we ran a regression analysis on it, by far the biggest factor that would determine whether an accident results in a loss of life or not, it's to do with alcohol and use of drugs. And it's, um, uh, you know, it's how people are behaving on the roads that is uh, one of the, uh, the big factors. So I think there's a, there's a lot there's a lot there, but the syntax thing in particular, in terms of raising uh, um, revenues, maybe I can turn um, first of all to you, Vanarit. I mean, um, uh, what might be your views about how we can do this? I'm thinking in a time of crisis, like a COVID crisis, and going back to Chia Sare's point, maybe these are the times when we can think of more radical ideas, that we can look at ideas we hadn't developed fully, and we can seize opportunities that maybe we had left by the side. But would, would, would syntaxes and something like this be one of those ideas? Over to you. It's to me, Nick? Yes, please. Okay, so thank you. I, I, think, I, I think during this time of crisis, we need a, a kind of radical paradigm shift in terms of thinking, in terms of uh, 
exploiting things. So I, I think the, the syntax is, it has a, a strong moral value, right? So I, I think in the future trend, I think moral economy or ethic, ethical economy will, will gain more momentum. Uh, started in, in Europe, they start to, to have a taxonomy for sustainable development, right? So, and, and, and we'll impose uh, on uh, other countries as well that wish to do business and trade with European countries. So I think uh, syntax uh, is, uh, is have high moral value and it is viable. Uh, and, and this can, can of course, uh, increase uh, the domestic uh, revenues. But of course, we have to ensure uh, uh, have transparent tax collections, right? <laughs> And I really applaud Cambodia in terms of a capacity in raised tax, but I think there's some more room to, to reduce the uh, tax leakages, leakages, right? Uh, to increase the tax revenue. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take uh, one more question um, also from, um, um, one more from David, then I'll move on, which, uh, and maybe uh, Exeter Chiasere, I can come back to you on this one because he's, uh, David's question, next question is on uh, uh, blended finance and impact in, um, investment. Um, and he's saying that certainly as my firm has spent the last few week, years working on a, a few projects, creating the required ecosystems before we could submit bankable projects to impact investors, we're implementing today uh, last due diligence steps for a major cassava starch factory uh, for a Hong Kong based group with a top notch impact investment investors, uh, the land degradation and neutrality fund of the UNCCD. Um, and, um, and a local a a MFI um, have dedicated uh, up to 70% of the loan portfolio as uncollateralized loans. That's a real breakthrough. Um, so impact investors are hungry for such bankable projects from Cambodia, but one needs to spend time and hard work to sniff and craft out uh, bankable projects. So I think what David's saying there is, that it, is it's the investment in uh, maybe the creation of the actual project to attract the investor that's, that's uh, one of the main um, things needed to, to expand uh, PPP type arrangements. Um, Excellency, what, what, what might be your comments or your views on this? Uh, so it wasn't a question. I think, yes, we, we need to have a good project, a bankable project. But then, um, as I said, even when you have a bankable project, you don't have enough financing to come in. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that there are impact investors who are interested in to, to come into Cambodia. Yeah, now that's certainly good news. And we hope that uh, uh, we hope to see that project um, um, will uh, will uh, will see the light of day. Um, OK, so I have um, uh, Antola Hui and a question um, from CDC to Dr. Narek. Um, so, uh, yeah, Runs Narek, we've got a question on our report. What, what are the reasons for choosing 2025 for the projection and DFA? The national, uh, um, uh, the NSDP also projects the uh, medium term financial mo mobilization up to 2023. The 2015 FDA projected the data up to 2025 with a scenario analysis too. Um, I think we, we just thought that the medium term was a, a sensible um, a, a cutoff point that maybe going further than that was, was getting more and more speculative. But uh, Narek, what's your question on about technically why we, why we aimed for uh, a 2025 time horizon? Yes, uh, actually you already answered. We, we, we already, uh, we only forecast uh, in up to the uh, five years medium term. We, we think that uh, it, it it more uh, accurate uh, to have a medium term projection rather than uh, a longer term because a lot of things happening so we cannot uh, really take those things into account the um, unobservable uh, uh, factor that uh, uh, happening so up to 2025 20, we think that the uh, uh, flow can be uh, more reliable uh, more accurately uh, forecasting Thank you, Narod. And I see that we have Dr. In Chani um, from uh, Akleda Bank um, has uh, joined us and he, he has posted a question. Um, and, and let, let me um, uh, read this question. Um, I think to encourage local investors to invest 
other sectors beside real estate, we should look into fair taxation. For example, if investors invest in land for speculation, they don't have a high tax obligation, or they may pay no tax at all for um, unused land. I've seen in the report presented by Dr. Naren, Cambodia got the high tax, indirect tax in, in comparison to other countries. So tax incentives should apply to other industries besides real estate. On the other hand, if customers place their fixed term deposit, they're required to pay tax on fixed deposits. It's far less incentive than to invest in land. I can see um, um, uh, Chang Vanaret is nodding. So I'm, I'm going to pass to him, if I may, to, uh, uh, to comment on Dr. Inchanari's um, question. That is a great idea. Fully support <laughs> to increase tax on real estates and land. And then divert the tax incentive to the impact investment. So that is a very important and shift if the government really serious about long-term social impact investment and sustainable development. Thank you. We're not worried that a, a taxation like that at this at this particular fragile point could hurt um, the construction um, uh, and investment sector. I mean, it's uh, it's already under a lot of pressure. I mean, would now be the right time to do this? Yes, um, I think you're right. The, the timing is not yet right, but I think maybe in the next few years, one or two years from now, I mean, in the post-COVID age, then I think we, we should consider this proposal. We yeah, have, I, please. I, I just wanted to say that we should also distinguish between, um, you know, properties for investments and, you know, first home owner, for instance. Um, so if I'm, if I'm a first time buyer, the, the, say the Ministry of Urban and Development should be able to distinguish me that this is this is my only properties and therefore there should be some actually tax incentive for people to get their first properties. Um, and I but I agree, you know, from the second, third, fourth, fifth, or whatever, um, there should be some more tax on because I mean if you have you can afford you know your third, fourth, fifth, I don't know tenth properties, then you should also be able to pay more tax than the others. Um, quite agree with that. Thank you, Excellency. I see that Excellency Rossellavar, you, you've raised your hand. Excellency, over to you. Right. He's on mute. <laughs> need to unmute. There you go. Sorry, I, uh, I, I didn't uh, mean that I'm uh, raising hand, uh, but anyway, I just want to uh, make uh, some comment on the taxation. Uh, I think uh, going forward, we, we need to have uh, some kind of a uh, drastic uh, shift from the, uh, the current system whereby we, uh, uh, we have an ecosystem that uh, very much favor the uh, real estate sector. Uh, and uh, the, the the fact that uh, we uh, the government uh, because of the uh, the incentive provided to private sector sector in a way uh, uh, through tax uh, low tax station on land for example that the government uh, run off uh, the reserve land so uh, come to investment on uh, a good project we don't have uh, any land to provide to some strategic investor. So I, I, I think that a good idea to, to think about how uh, to uh, uh, reallocate the, the burden. So maybe raise some tax on land, on unused land, or maybe on unproductive uh, land, land uh, second, third property, for example, would be a good idea. But uh, 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 policy from uh, from idea from analysis to uh, the, uh, uh, the the policy and uh, the the implementation I think take time. So, but we need to have a consensus on what kind of uh, tax uh, uh, that uh, favor equitable distribution of wealth and what kind of tax uh, to promote a competitive uh, economy and what kind of tax uh, incentivize uh, productive investment, for example. I think that would be the subject of further discussion and uh, study. So 
not just say this good, that good, that not good. Uh, it is it, just a view, but uh, come, uh, uh, to be able to, to have a, a good policy, good uh, tax uh, policy, I think uh, we need uh, further discussion on this. So just uh, uh, some idea on that. <laughs> but I do agree with that. We need to do something with uh, regard to, uh, you know, the, the tax uh, system whereby the, the uh, real estate sector prosper very much uh, at the, the, the cost of uh, uh, growing economy. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. And in, in, in many ways, we we have, you could say, a good problem to deal with. And in, in, in fact, that we're dealing with um, a very good record of tax collection and tax collection of GDP looking, you know, close to 20% has been the historic, you know, uh, figures that we've seen in Cambodia, uh, much ahead of others in, in, in the region. And so it's more a question of uh, getting to diversify some of uh, um, that uh, taxation um, uh, uh, income. And, and in fact, we're joined, I can see, in, in, in the attendees by uh, His, His Excellency uh, Pen Tirong. And we had uh, His Excellency led a, a, a really good session this morning with World Bank colleagues and others on, um, on taxation policy, which I know has been um, under uh, the leadership of MEF. Um, so it's an interesting way that we can look at taxation, but also from a holistic point of view, where we can deal with other policy uh, incentives as well. And Radhika, I see that you've got your, your, your hand up as well on, on this point, over to you. Thank you, Nick. I just wanted to make two quick points on this. I mean, just to say that, um, I mean, for us, the DFA is really not a report. Um, it's a process. It's uh, an, an iterative process. So this has really provided a very rich um, set of recommendations and findings in a way that's easy to process, but really outlines um, you know, a, a number of different areas for further work. Um, and including on the on the tax agenda, you know, which is also linked to transparency and information on how taxes are used to encourage um, further taxation, um, the whole question of incentives and whether the kinds of incentives that are in place are in line with with government's agenda around equity, around diversification, um, and how do you shift those? What combination of regulatory instruments, um, tax steering, you know, tax as a steering mechanism, and others can actually help promote those kind of shifts. Um, and, you know, the kind of work that can be done to deepen each of these emerging areas which require further work, you know, with stakeholders. Uh, and I think that's the beauty of the DFA and the INFF, that it facilitates this kind of initial mapping and then the deep dives and the kind of work that's required for, for all of these. Uh, one thing that I didn't hear uh, much about, um, which can help with some of these different elements is digitalization. Um, I think you mentioned, Nick, uh, that the central bank had launched the digital payments platform, but you know, uh, shifting to e-taxation, helping to build up the ICT sector in multiple ways could be, um, could be both disruptive, but also unleash a whole set of new opportunities, facilitate um, the transparency agenda, the reporting, make it easier to, to get information around um, the portfolio. So, you know, it, it can be increased productivity. I mean, just other things so would be useful to hear how these, uh, these different uh, drivers of change can be connected. For me as a political economist, um, I find it hard to just focus on finance by itself, given the linkages that are there and need to be looked at with the real economy, but also with the, the policy and the regulatory space, um, you know, more broadly. Uh, thank you for that. Radhika, thank you. And, you know, you raised this point about how uh, electronic and uh, new innovations in uh, financing bring opportunities uh, in accountability and transparency. Um, and other good things. And I think that links very neatly. Maybe we need to close because I see that we're coming up almost to five o'clock, but maybe before I do, I could come to, for a last comment on that issue about the opportunities that come with uh, um, electronic, with e-innovations um, in financing. Maybe I can come back to Excellency Chia Saray on, on that point. 
um, and, and maybe you know, developing on some of the ideas that uh, Radhika was sharing right now um, and thinking about the development financing flows coming into the future, um, maybe share some thoughts or some comments from uh, the National Bank of Cambodia's point of view. Uh, Excellency, over to you. Um, thank you. I, I, I fully agree with Radhika on, on you know, digitization, how it can help accelerate a lot of or solve the, a lot of the problems that we are currently facing. Um, just uh, for information, the Ministry of Economic and Finance or the, the government has already work, is, is working on a um, digital economy strategy. Um, and another organized what well, another strategy is on uh, digital government. I think that's a, a good start. The um, Lake Joe Startup Center is also working on uh, some of the infrastructure uh, to facilitate that. So the Cambodia Data Exchange is actually going to be a, a, a great infrastructure to link um, all the ministry into a center points and allow easier access to information uh, for the private sector. Now having, I mean, this is something that is ongoing, um, but from the National Bank of Cambodia, there was a mention about, you know, it's very difficult to get people to borrow money uncollateralized. And that's in a way digital can help with, you know, I, I sit at the board of the Credit Bureau of Cambodia and I see how it, it can change, you know, the way banks, uh, understand their customers. So usually when, when there is a high interest rate charges is because there is an asymmetry information between the clients and the bank. So what you try to do with the credit bureau information is to reduce that asymmetry and provide the bank as much data as possible about its potential client or its, uh, its client. And so with, let's say a, a digital payment system, what it does is that the first entry point to access to financial services for, for, for a company or for anyone, um, I think the easiest would be access to payment because you know not everyone has the money to save, not everyone is in need of credit, but everyone is making payment on a daily basis. What if you can bring these people to do their payment digitally? And this is something that we have observed increasing during this pandemic is that you know electronic payment has been increasing um, significantly over the past year. And so with this payment, digital payment, what you're able to do with dig digitalization is you you can see the, the payment behavior or the cash flow behavior of, of the seller and, and the buying behavior of the buyer. And in a way, you know, with some algorithm, you, you can come up with a or psychometric uh, algorithm, you can come up with, you know, certain um, sort of rating of the customer. And, and it does help banks in a way to, to better understand and eventually, hopefully, uh, can give credits uh, uncollateralized. But having said that, it would be very difficult for corporate to do so. And mainly, as uh, Van Rit was mentioning, is, is that the, the legal system is quite complicated. So if you can lend to a company without collateral, it means that the company itself is what you're going to put your hands on as a bank when you know everything's go wrong, right? So let's say the company goes bankrupt and what you hope is that you will get something out of the company. Um, in the whole history of bankruptcy law of Cambodia, we have only uh, managed to get one, I think one, two or one or two company through the bankruptcy process. Um, and that's too little to actually give confidence to the bankers that you know eventually if, if let's say I give money to the company, uncollateralized, um, a clean loan, uh, what happened if the company go bankrupt? What what can I put my hand on? Will I get the, the machineries? Will I get at least, you know, the, the office supplies to, to cover my uh, my my loan? So the, the, this uncertainty is something that I think uh, as a government, we, we need to, to be more forthcoming and explain uh, more to, uh, to the private sector with the commercial arbitration in place. I think that's also a good sign uh, and give uh, a lot of, uh, I mean, some level of trust to the private sector as well. Um, so that's uh, that's it for me. Excellency, thank you very much. And I think you know the, to, that's a good note to end on. I think two two points there. You know, the, um, uh, you, know you echo the point that I think that Banneret was making about the legal playing field that that needs to be strengthened and needs to be leveled. You know, if, if, if we need to have confidence in the bankruptcy mechanism, we need to have confidence in the. Uh, uh, legal reg the legal regulatory frameworks for further investment. But also I think optimistically, 
looking at the opportunities for Cambodia on uh, digitization, you know, particularly looking at access to payments as a gateway through into that uh, into that work. Um, and I'm echoing Radhika's points on accountability and transparency. So I'm, I'm hoping that's an optimistic note for us to end on as we look to uh, financing um, for few, uh, into the future for Cambodia. Um, Rani, I think that we can uh, draw our, our, our meeting now to a conclusion. Is that right? Yes, um, we, we will uh, ask our like, also, like, take this uh, opportunity, like, to share the QR code that people can, uh, participants can also download the report and, yeah, and we already, like, passed the presentation of uh, Dr. Ron in the chat box. I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, thank my panelists, uh, Excellency um, uh, Chia Sarai, the Assistant Governor and Director General at the National Bank of Cambodia, uh, Dr. Kian Banarit, the President of the Asia Division Institute, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Radhika Lau, the Senior SDG Finance Policy Advisor to UNDP. Um, and then, of course, uh, my thanks also to His Excellency uh, Ross Salavar, the Secretary of State at the Ministry um, of Economy and Finance for opening and guiding our session today. Um, and also my thanks to uh, Ms. Christine Parco, the Acting UN Resident Coordinator. Um, and um, uh, and last but not least, my thanks also to Dr. Tim Ramsin Narit and to Dr. Pete Chandarani um, and Ivan colleagues who worked so hard on for this report. Um, thank you everybody for joining us and thank you for such a great session. What he did there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.